Matthew Bernard formerly from the uh, uh, University of um, Florida and uh, co-founder of uh, Myelin. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to start by thanking conference organizers uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, there are some people in the room who I consider to be giants whose shoulders I stand on, so I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'm humbled and honored by that opportunity, so thank you. Uh, so yes, I am Matthew Bellman. I am the co-founder and the chief technology officer of Myelin. We're based in Gainesville, Florida in the U.S. Uh, I was formerly one of Dr. Dixon's PhD students, graduated in 2015, and a lot of the uh, work that he presented earlier was work that I did as part of my dissertation focused on FES cycling. Um, so as you saw in uh, Dr. Dixon's presentation, uh, I started working on FES in 2009, so 10 years ago, and at that time we were really focused on leg extension as kind of the activity that we were looking at. We were really stim stimulating the quadriceps, focused on leg extension. Um, but then as I entered grad school, the focus shifted to FES cycling. And when I looked at the literature that was available at that time, I saw an opportunity to make some improvements to what had been done past in FES cycling through controls and a lot of the control systems theory that Dr. Dixon presented. So technically I am a control systems engineer, um, used to do a lot of math, not so much anymore. Um, but my focus during my dissertation was really on optimizing power output and efficiency during FES cycling so that with higher power output, we can increase the exercise intensity. With better efficiency, we can do act uh, activities for longer. Um, and I was really looking at mobile cycling. So that, in fact, that image on the right there that Dr. Dixon had some video of, that's actually me on the trike that I built uh, that was a motorized trike with uh, power meters and use the hazmat stimulator. Um, and then somewhere along the way, I, at some point I had made the decision that I wanted to start a company because I saw that as the biggest impact that I could make on the world is through the vehicle of a business. And I also didn't want my research to, once I graduated, go into a closet and sit and collect dust forever. I wanted to get the benefits of what I was doing out there to people real people to make a real impact. Um, so that was in uh, 2013, while I was still working on my PhD, which was crazy, uh, we started Myelin. Um, I started that with my co-founder, Alan Hamlet, who was also pursuing a PhD in mechanical engineering at the time. Fortunately, we both actually graduated and finished our PhD, so that was a plus. And then from 2015 onwards, we've been full-time with Myelin. Um, and as we were, you know, as a graduate student working on FES cycling, again, really focused on performance. I'm an engineer, I'm in the lab. I wasn't really interacting a lot with people with paralysis or with clinicians and therapists. Uh, but once we started the company and really started to dig into the market and do market research, uh, there was an interesting shift in mentality because where before I was really focused on performance and mobile outdoor cycling, um, once we started talking to patients and to therapists, we kept hearing the same story over and over again. And that story was, well, I had a spinal cord injury. I went to this rehab facility. It was awesome. They had therapists. They had equipment. They had FES bikes. I made a lot of progress, made a lot of improvement, uh, had a really good time. Uh, but now, for whatever reason, I'm back at home. I don't have access to those things anymore. And because of that, my health is starting to deteriorate. Um, and I'm finding it difficult to do the things that uh, I need to do in order to maintain and improve my health. So a natural thing for a lot of people is, well, I use the FES bike in rehab. It, it seems like I could get one of those at home. That would be awesome. Um, and then they find out that the average sale price for an FES bike is about $20,000. And typically, insurance won't cover it. So that becomes a huge financial obstacle for people. Um, and so we shifted from focusing on power output and outdoor cycling to it seems like what is really needed in this market is something that is affordable and easy to use so that more people can have access to it, ideally at home, because these people with chronic conditions, they need to use this ideally on a, well, as, as often as possible. Um, 
or if not that, then in a community environment or a rehab facility down the road where they can get access to it. Um, so that really became the focus of Myelin, and that's what we've been focused on ever since, is making this technology affordable and easy to use so people can get access to it. And that's what I really want to talk about today, is increasing access to FES cycling. Uh, but before I do that, I want to give a little bit of background on FES cycling from the commercial perspective that a lot of people may not really recognize, um, being in the research environment. So over, I think it was, and Glenn, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but about 35 years ago, 1984, that the first FES bike hit the market. And that was the Regis, which is in the top left corner there. It's hard to see because it's a picture from the 80s. Um, and since then, there have been several commercially, there have been several FES bikes that have been commercialized, um, primarily in the United States. Um, so we have the Stim Master, which kind of morphed out of the Therapeutic Alliances company, who was making the Regis, which then became the Urgis. Uh, we have Burkle Bike, uh, Hazamed had the Reha Bike for a while. I don't think they sell that anymore. Um, Motomed has a, they partnered with Hazamed and combined the two systems to make an FES bike. There's a company in Italy that makes an FES bike called the Pegaso, although I've never seen one in real life. Um, and then Restorative Therapies, based in Baltimore in the United States, really for the last 15 years has been the major player in FES cycling. Um, and then we came out with the MyoCycle in 2017. Um, and my best guess, uh, based on the information that I have and the conversations I've had with other people in the industry, is that over that period of 35 years, less than 10,000 FES bikes have been sold. That's probably a really generous number, but it's a nice, clean, even number to talk about. Um, and I'm really bad at math in my head, but that comes out to about an average of 250 bikes a year over that entire period. And I know that in 2018, there were about, mm, give or take, 600 FES bikes sold internationally, like all across the globe. With the vast majority of that being RTI, then us, then some Motomeds, and then some bits and pieces from some other companies. Um, and when you, when you think about those numbers, again, like to put that into context, you know, Peloton, it, most people know about Peloton, I imagine. Um, company in the US is making a stationary bike. You can stream spin classes. Um, I think that they are up to, I know that in the last two years they've sold 500,000 bikes, something like that. Um, obviously, their market is a lot bigger, but that's a really small number, especially given how long FES bikes have been available and how well perceived the clinical benefits of FES cycling are and the numerous attempts by various companies to make it happen. Um, and this is especially abysmal when you consider the populations that FES cycling can serve. Um, so a few years ago, Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation did a study where they took a different approach to figuring out how many people are out there with paralysis. And this is the number that they came up with, um, which is a lot larger than other people have estimated using uh, clinical data. Um, and so that's people with paralysis in the United States. I won't talk about global numbers because, frankly, the data is not that great, so I, I can't really estimate. Um, but that's caused by stroke, MS, spinal cord injury, cerebral palsy, and some others. And a fairly rough, accurate number is that about 50% of those people could benefit significantly from regular participation in FES cycling. So even using conservative numbers, we're talking globally millions of people that could benefit from regular FES cycling. And if you consider, so that's prevalence, if you consider the incidence, we're talking tens to hundreds of thousands of new people every year who could really be benefiting from using an FES bike. Um, so if there are millions of people but we've only sold, we've only gotten maybe 10,000 bikes out there in the last 35 years. That's a really, really, really small market penetration. Uh, so something's wrong there. So the question is, what is that? Um, there are a lot of reasons 
for that. Um, but the two big ones that I see and that we are really focused on is cost and complexity. So when talking about FES bikes, generally people agree they're expensive and they're difficult to use. Remember, I mentioned before that the average sale price historically for an FES bike has been about $20,000. That goes up to $40,000. Um, and hard to use is really characterized well by the fact that, especially in the, in the United States, if you purchase a, a, a RT300 FES bike from Restorative Therapies, because it's so complicated, they need to send a trained specialist out to your home to set up the bike for you, to do the installation, to show you how to use it, to tune and tweak the parameters. Um, and then I'm sure people in the room have had lots of experiences with tuning and tweaking an FES bike and making the setup, getting somebody set up on it and getting the parameters set and tuned and adjusted for that individual to make it so that they're gonna have a good experience with it. Um, and those two things really dramatically limit the market. Obviously, cost limits access uh, it, to a huge extent. So, especially when you consider that the population of people par with paralysis is highly unemployed or underemployed, and then on top of that has a tremendous amount of healthcare expenses, especially in the United States. Um, so that limits access <coughs> dramatically. And then the complexity side of things, that's a little, that's a bit more nuanced. Um, so, one of the reasons why FES bikes are so expensive, especially if you're buying one for home use, is that in-home installation. It costs a lot of money to send somebody out to somebody's home, spend a couple hours with them. That, just the logistics of doing that is very expensive from a business standpoint. So it's not, it's not even really about the cost of the bike itself. I mean, it's a stationary exercise bike. It's got a muscle stimulator on it. There's nothing about that that's particularly expensive but it's the cost of doing business around that device, especially since it's considered to be a medical device, so you have to go through regulatory issues and testing and retesting when you change things. Uh, that becomes very expensive. Uh, and that complexity affects that pricing. Um, and the complexity also affects clinical use. So I said there's at best 10,000 FES bikes that have been sold uh, globally the vast majority of those have been sold into people's homes, and there's maybe a thousand clinics worldwide that have purchased an FES bike for use. When there are ostensibly tens of thousands of clinics that could, have, that could be using an FES bike clinically on a regular basis because they have a sufficiently large neurological population that could benefit from having an FES bike. But FES bikes are hard to use. Um, most of the therapists that I've met in my travels are not super well educated about electrical stimulation and FES cycling, and it's complicated. And when you're in a clinical environment, you need to get thing, you need to get a patient set up quickly. You need to get them in and out of therapy. Um, you're billing on 15-minute increments, which is really actually eight-minute increments. So time is of the essence. Um, and therapists, oftentimes with people with paralysis, are more focused on say, learning how to use a wheelchair, or how to manage bowel and bladder, or how to do all of these other things, then they are focused on providing this therapeutic exercise. Um, so for, the, for many different reasons, cost and complexity are big issues. So what we have done, um, I mentioned we started Myelin and began this uh, journey to make an FES bike that was affordable and easy to use to address these issues. Um, in 2017, we developed the MyoCycle. So for the remainder here, I'm really just going to talk about what the MyoCycle is and what it does and how it addresses those cost and complexity issues. I'm going to kind of skim through some of this stuff because my goal isn't really to educate you about the MyoCycle here. My goal is just to explain some of the ways that we've tried to tackle those problems. And then I want to get to the end where there's some interesting discussion points and kind of leave the, the conversation open there. Um, so, MyoCycle, it's an FES bike, it's essentially a stationary exercise bike. It has a motor in it, it has a six channel muscle stimulator in it designed to stimulate quads, glutes, and hamstrings. These right here, you talk about what manufacturers say are the benefits. That's what we can legally say the benefits are, um, and those are pretty undeniable. 
Um, and then the rest of it is, well, here's some research that suggests that you might get some of these other benefits if you were to use an FES bike regularly. So bone loss, uh, we don't really, I never really talk too much about functional outcomes because there's basically no data on functional outcomes. Um, and there's some of the other benefits that Glenn talked about. And then there are this on the list of the spasticity uh, that's, that's been proven. Yes. So it's accepted. Well, there is, so generally, the way FES bikes are regulated in the United States is they're considered basically powered muscle stimulators. So from the regulatory perspective, it's really about the stimulator, forget about the bike. And stimulation in FES has been shown unequivocally to have those benefits. Okay. Now so FES cycling is a little bit, it's a more complicated story. We, we, I didn't talk about today, but yeah, it's oh, in the box. It's, it's a tick, yeah, it's a tick. It is, okay. It is okay. a tick, yeah. And, just, yeah. and just to touch on that, since Glenn didn't really get into spasticity, um, generally we see Reduction in spasticity is one of the greatest benefits of using an FES bike regularly. And what actually happens is you have a reduction in the frequency of muscle spasms. The intensity of muscle spasms goes up because your muscles get stronger. Yeah. Um, and that's always an interesting experience for people. Um, I didn't include it in here. I'm, I'm just going to tell the story. So our very first customer was a guy in Gainesville named Peter. His testimony was on our website. He actually has multiple sclerosis. He presents as an incomplete quadriplegic. He uses a power chair, very little leg function, pretty good upper extremity function. Um, when he came to us, he could not stand on his own, but if you helped him up, he could maintain standing with a walker, and with his good leg, he could get, he could get about that much. Um, and then, like I said, pretty good upper body function. He was our first customer. He bought a monocycle. He used it for eight weeks at home and about an hour a day and um, we got a call from his wife who told us a story that he she was on uh, a computer with a Skype chat with his with Peter's mother so his wife's on a video call with his mother in the living room Peter walks across the background of the video and his mother says Oh, who do you have over? She didn't recognize that that was her son walking across the background of the video because he was walking. He wasn't in his chair. Um, so for Peter, he, he regained the ability to stand on his own. And then with a walker, he's able to take nine or ten steps, sleeps a lot better. And for Peter, almost all of those benefits come from reduction in spasticity because he's not fighting himself anymore. When he's trying to stand up, everything's loose enough that he can do that um, and his body's not fighting him. Um, so MyoCycle, like a lot of other FES bikes, it's got a touch screen. Uh, it's got some things that hook onto your wheelchair to keep your wheelchair from moving around. Um, the handlebar height's adjustable. Our pedals are pretty neat. They're actually cam walkers, so they're surgical boots that we take apart and readapt for the purpose. Um, and you can move it around easily. It's got a six channel muscle stimulator in it. Um, the intensity goes up to 120 milliamps, 500 microseconds. It's a biphasic waveform. Uh, we use a fixed frequency of 60 hertz. Um, when you max that out, it's a lot of stimulation. Um, oh, there's some neat things about it. Uh, so our system's designed to accommodate people four foot eight to really, there's not really an upper limit on height. Um, and the crank arms are a little shorter than what you find on a road bike, um, but they're not super short. So you get a little bit less range of motion than you get on a normal bicycle, but still really good range of motion. Um, because of the way it's designed, you can use it really from any stable chair. So you could use it from one of these chairs or your power chair or the manual chairs. Um, and one of the unique things about the MyoCycle in comparison to other uh, FES bikes, and this is where, well, let me, take, let me take one step back because I'm supposed to be telling you about ease of use, cost, and complexity. Um, so this whole thing has been designed. We designed it from the ground up ourselves. Uh, we manufacture it in Gainesville, and we are responsible for the entire system. A lot of the other FPS bikes out there, the RT300, which is kind of the gold standard, 
that's built on the TheraTrainer platform, which is a bike they buy from Germany, ship over to the US, they put their stimulator on it, and then sell it onwards. Um, that adds to the cost of goods and the cost of doing business. Uh, we manufacture it ourselves. So that helps with the cost. Um, but really, it's the complexity where we make a big difference here. And before I get into the, the software and the stimulation side of things, I just want to point out that the way we've designed the myocycle from a physical perspective allows anybody with pretty good, is the best I can give you, upper body function to use it by themselves independently at home. There are some characteristics of the other FBS bikes out there that make it really difficult for you as a wheelchair user to get yourself set up on the bike and start using it on your own. We still have these, the bipolar self-adhesive electrodes, so you still got to put all these electrodes on, you still got to plug them in, you still have to get your feet into the pedals and hook your chair up, but we've made that process as easy as we possibly can without making some major changes to just what is FES cycling. Um, and one of the things that makes the MyoCycle really easy to use is the way that we've implemented the motor control and how the motor works. So the motor is isokinetic. It always goes at the same speed. That speed is 35 RPM. It does not go slower. It does not go faster. The nice thing about that is if you need help pedaling, it pedals for you. It, it provides assistance. But as soon as you try to make the pedals go faster, either with volitional control input or with electrical stimulation, it resists with exactly the same amount of force that you put in to maintain that constant speed. Um, and the reason that that makes things a lot easier from a user perspective, it's a lot easier to use, is you don't have to think about what speed should I be going at. You don't have to tune and tweak your resistance. You don't have to set these target speeds and control speeds, which are all characteristics of the other FPS bikes that are available. Um, really, the motor is just it's just there doing its thing. Um, and because it works this way, you always get a nice, smooth, steady, consistent pedal stroke until you get, when, when somebody is, their strength builds up and they become very strong and can really crank on this thing, then they get to the point where they can start to overpower. They're even stronger than the motor itself. Um, and then another thing about doing only 35 RPM is that it enables us to do really well a calibrated measurement of active power output. So in cycling, there's passive work and there's active work. So the passive work is the work you have to do to move your own legs in space in a cyclic motion, and then you have to overcome the basic resistance of the mechanism itself before you can then begin to pedal against additional resistance, which is normally what is registered by an exercise bike as power output that you're doing. When you have somebody who's weak, um, and isn't able to overcome those basic resistances, um, on another cycling platform, you wouldn't be able to really see how much work they're doing because it's basically being shadowed by those pass the passive resistances of the bike. So at the beginning of every session on a myocycle, it does a calibration. So it actually, we use the motor as a torque sensor and we measure the passive work. So how, what is the work involved in just moving that person's legs at 35 RPM? And then once the warm-up done, that, that calibration period is done, we subtract that passive work out from what the motor is doing. And all that's left is the active work coming from the person who's riding the bike. So when we show somebody their power output on the screen, it's active power output coming from their muscles. There's never any question of how much is the bike doing, how much is the person doing. Um, and whether the motor's on or off, it's always on, but it's either assisting or resisting based on that power output. Um, our stimulation I mentioned, it's biphasic uh, rectangular symmetric pulses. That's what it looks like, which is pretty standard. Um, there's not really anything special here. It goes up to 500 microseconds on that pulse duration. Um, but one of the things that we do, so on the myocycle, it's I'm going to get into more about how the, the simulation works, but the pulse width is what's really changing during a workout session. And then you have the ability for each muscle group to set the amplitude at either 50, 90, or 120 milliamps. But we don't call it that. We call it low, medium, and high because people at home don't know what milliamps are. They know what low, medium, and high means. So on each different muscle group, they can have a low, medium, and high. And then the pulse width is varied according to a level 
that they set. And that's a zero through 20 number, just like you hop on an exercise bike in a gym and you crank the resistance up to 10, you hop on the myocycle, you crank the stimulation up to 10, and if you were at 10, you'd be getting 250 microseconds of stimulation. Um, and then our frequency, we fix at 60 hertz. Uh, that's based on some work that Esther did uh, in 2003 that looked at the influence of different stimulation frequencies on power output and fatigue during FES cycling with spinal cord injury. Um, and just in our experience and my experience, like Dr. Dixon said, over the years we've done a lot of work looking at different frequencies and modulation strategies and, and everything. Um, we have found that for FES cycling, 60 hertz is a really good number. Uh, the max gets good muscle power output with surprisingly without being too fatiguing. Um, although, again, with this particular application, fatigue isn't such an issue for us because the purpose is simply to exercise the muscles. Um, and then where things get really unique, and this is where a lot of the work I did in my dissertation comes in, is the stimulation pattern. So the pattern is when you turn the muscles on and off, how the intensity changes between those two points. Um, so we calculate the stimulation pattern for each individual based on their geometry. If you think about FES cycling, especially when you have a fixed ankle, an ankle that's fixed in a boot, um, it's basically a four bar mechanism. And you can totally define a four bar mechanism based on the measurements of the links, how long those links in the four bar are, and one angle, which is the crank angle. So we measure the crank angle on the bike, and then we plug in measurements of the patient's thigh length, their lower leg length, the height of their chair off the ground, and we make an uh, assumption about, given the height of the chair off the ground, what's the height of their hip off the ground, and we know the height of the crank off the ground, and then we make an assumption about how far away they are from the bike. Um, and based on that, we can fully define that four bar mechanism. And the cool thing about that is, is it allows us to calculate what we call the torque transfer ratios. And all that means is kinematically, if I produce an extensor torque at my knee, that's gonna extend my knee, how much of that torque makes it to the crank and pedals the crank forward? So if I extend my knee here, will it pedal the crank forward? And if so, how much? Or will it back pedal? Or will it hit a dead spot and just stop the thing? Um, so this is what that kind of looks like. Uh, the, these torque ratios, of uh, blue is for the knee, red is for the hip, uh, from zero to 360 or two pi radians. Um, and based on those, we construct envelopes, stimulation envelopes. And what's happening here is from zero to 360, the pulse width on what's shown here is four different channels uh, is has a curvature to it, much like the uh, torque transfer ratio is. And then that level I mentioned, zero through 20, it simply scales this up. It's basically a multiple on this. Um, so you get these profiles that you end up stimulating muscle when it has a peak effectiveness. So you, you stimulate it more when it's more effective to do so, less when it's less effective to do so, and not at all when you might be stopping or backpedaling. And all of that is automatically generated based on measurements of thigh length, lower leg length, and the height of their chair off the ground. So when somebody gets a myocycle, all they need to do is take those measurements, which are pretty forgiving in, in terms of how far off somebody can be, plus or minus a few centimeters in their measurements. Um, and the bike has controls built into it so they don't put in a, a thigh length of a million miles or a lower leg length of zero. Um, and that generates a stimulation pattern for them. And then from there, the user has control over the low, medium, and high for their muscle groups, and that zero through 20. So it becomes, it's very simple, very easy to use, and you can very quickly and easily find the maximum tolerable stimulation level for each muscle group, and the user can do that by themselves. So one of the real unique things about the myocycle is, I mentioned with restorative therapies, they have to send somebody out to somebody's home to set the bike up for them. The myocycle, we can ship straight to somebody's door. They can unbox, assemble it, start using it, plug these measurements in, start getting a good workout with the FES cycling on their own, even if they've never seen an FES bike before. And that's the experience for the vast majority of our customers. Most of our customers are people at home um, who don't have a lot of, certainly not experts in FES cycling. 
don't really have a lot of experience setting themselves up on things. Um, and one of the most consistently <laughs> positive pieces of feedback that we get is, wow, it was really easy to unbox this thing and set it up and start using it. I'm really surprised. Um, electrodes and everything is pretty much the same as other FES bikes. I mentioned the motorcycle is designed for quads, glutes, and hamstrings. That's typically what has been done over the last 35 years as are big muscle groups. We do have customers who will say, well, I don't want to put the electrodes on my glutes today. I'm going to put them on my calves instead. Um, so those muscles get stimulated at the same, at the timing that they would get stimulated if they were glutes. Um, but since the foot's constrained in the pedal, it doesn't really have an effect on the cycling itself. Um, so really, again, it, it's from a setup perspective, it's not too different from other FES bikes from a physical perspective of actually getting set up on it. Um, but when you do get set up, you know, that's, that's kind of what it looks like. Nice, easy, smooth. Um, and that's a good setup there. Um, we have the wheelchair attachments, which all, all is to say is that we've made it as easy as possible to hook your own wheelchair up onto the thing and keep it from moving around. Um, and again, that's what good FES cycling on the motorcycle looks like. Um, and that's uh, Amanda. She's a quadriplegic. She owns a motorcycle. She uses it by herself at home on a pretty consistent basis. Um, and that's what her setup looks like. Um, I'm just going to breeze through these screens just to kind of show you all what that interface actually looks like. Um, one of the things about usability is you want the minimum number of possible actions that a user can take at any given point in time. So, for example, here's the start screen. The only thing you can do is hit is start a session or go into settings. Um, the bike does connect to the internet, so it saves all of these, this workout data. Um, clinicians can log into our website and view detailed workout statistics, whereas home users, we send them weekly progress reports, which is a summary of what you did this week and how that compares to the week before that. Um, one of the things that having, so having a motor on an FES bike buys you accessibility. More people can use that bike right out of the box. Whereas, for example, the Urgis that didn't have a motor, if you weren't strong enough to keep the pedals going, you either needed somebody to pedal for you or you had to go through a strengthening program first before you could really start using the bike on your own. Um, so a motor helps you in that sense, but it also introduces some complexity. So, for example, what do you do if the person has a spasm? Do you just keep, have the motor just crank through that, or do you have it stop at some point? So we elected to stop at some point, but then you have to make decisions about, well, when are you going to stop? So we have this uh, spasm level in here, which is kind of a low, medium, and high setting. If it's on high, the motor's going to use all the power it has to keep things going. If it's on low, it'll stop at the slightest bit of resistance to the pedals. Um, and that's a simple adjustable thing there. I mentioned before, you can just pop in your measurements there. Um, and then it goes through. I mentioned that warm up. It estimates the passive work that's involved in cycling. That's a figure from my dissertation where we actually plotted what that passive torque looks like. Um, so with a regular able-bodied person, this is probably from me, um, you get the three or four newton meters at, you know, say 50 RPM, so you're talking 10, 15 watts of passive power that's involved. Um, touch screen with some displays and controls, like I said, this is your, here's how you control the stimulation, up, down. Super simple, easy to use. When you increase the stimulation, you get more stimulation in all the different muscle groups. And then on the bottom here, you have the ability to click each channel and set a low, medium, and high. Um, and you have your various displays, power output, distance, calories, typical things. Um, when you finish a workout, it gives you your summary. And like I said, weekly progress reports via email. It tells you if anything goes wrong. Um, so to kind of sum up the myocycle itself, um, it's very similar to other FES cycling systems. From a physical interface perspective, we've made a lot of design decisions that um, make it as easy as possible for somebody to get themselves set up on it. Um, but really where we make a big impact on the usability is in how we have automated some of the decisions that you have to make about stimulation and how we've 
um, allow the user to kind of play with the stimulation on their own so that they can make some decisions about the intensity and things that they might be setting. Um, in contrast, one thing that happens with, um, and this gets into exercise intensity and a lot of the studies that have been done, um, one of the characteristics of the RT300 um, is when somebody comes to someone's home and does that first setup for them, after they set the bike up for them, a lot of the settings become locked and the user doesn't have an opportunity to progress beyond those settings unless they call the company and say, hey, can you increase my numbers? And then that, the company goes in and changes the stuff. Um, so because we open up the stimulation to people and make the stimulation so much easier to use, so easy to use, in fact, that the user, total layperson with no experience with FES cycling, can adjust the stimulation themselves, what we find is that people get a much better uh, workout experience, they end up getting a lot more stimulation than they would on an RT300 because it's easier to get there on their own. Um, so some of the, the thoughts about cost and complexity um, is I see a lot just in literature in general when especially engineers talk about this new thing that they designed um, and how because they bought off-the-shelf parts and they just put it together, it's like, oh, well, it, you could do this for really cheap. Um, cost is so much more than cost of goods. Um, and it's the cost of doing business. It's the cost of getting the bike out there. It's the cost of the overhead support that's required. And so much of that depends on the complexity of the system itself. So it's really, really, really important, even from a cost perspective, to keep the complexity down. Um, and from a, I would encourage people who are working on new FES cycling engineering developments to really focus on automation and other kind of building intelligence into the system to make it much easier to use because not only does it help solve that cost problem, it also makes FES cycling more easily available to clinicians clinicians that aren't necessarily super experts on electrical stimulation or who even might be shy about using technology in a clinical situation, if you can make it so easy for them that they can just put, some, somebody can just pop right on it, click a few buttons and go and have a great experience and have a great workout and get good therapy, that makes it much more likely that clinics will start to adopt FES cycling. And if cl more clinics adopt FES cycling, that means more patients who become exposed to FES cycling become aware of FES cycling. I'm constantly shocked how many people have no idea what FES cycling is, um, even in the neuro rehab community. It's crazy. Um, so those things will really help to get FES cycling out there, which will enable us to make more FES bikes, and if we can make more FES bikes, the more you make of something, the cheaper it is to make it, we can continue to drive the cost down and really start to address that issue of accessibility for a lot of different people. Um, but one of the, perhaps the more interesting topic of conversation to have in this room is suppose you solve the cost and complexity problem. There are other things that must be considered in order to make FES cycling a really effective form of therapy from a very wide perspective. Um, James Rimmer at the Lakeshore Foundation um, in the US had a paper um, where they came up with this framework called the RAMP framework, which is Restoring Access, Mobility, and Participation. Um, and it's a really, really insightful piece of literature. And the topic of conversation there was so often, clinicians and engineers and other people come up with these interventions that are supposed to be some increase in physical activity or mobility or some therapeutic intervention, and then they bring a whole host of subjects in. The subjects get to do the par participate in the intervention. What the researchers are really doing is lowering, is removing barriers to access to that intervention for those people by giving them a place to do it and sometimes compensating them and then giving the education and the time of day. Um, but then once the study's over, people go home and it hasn't, you get no behavior change. Um, and then those people don't have access to that kind of technology outside the study. 
So FES cycling is a big victim of that, especially if you look at the whole history of FES cycling, where for 35 years we brought subjects into rehab uh, facilities and to research institutions. We do these kinds of interventions, and then we send them home, and then they don't have access to that kind of stuff anymore, and they're back to square one. Um, so what James came up with was this idea that there are certain criteria that need to be met in four different domains for a technology to really stick in the community. So that people will actually be, that a large percentage of the population will be participating in that activity on a regular basis. Um, and if you look at it, the very first one is access. So the person needs to be able to access the technology, um, which is what we talked about here. Um, so that can include, you know, if, if it's a facility um, like ants here, right? How do you, do, do people have access to it? Do they have transportation to get here? Is the facility itself accessible? Um, do they have somebody that can help them get to and fro? I don't know what it costs. You know, what are the costs involved? Um, for an FES bike at home, it's the cost of acquiring the system. It's, am I, do I have the resources that I need to be using it on a regular basis? Usability is the next thing. So can I use it effectively and efficiently on my own or with help from, with the resources that I have? Um, and that's, that's kind of the cost and complexity issue that I'm talking about here. But once you get past those points, adherence. Adherence is the big one. FES cycling, I believe, is boring. Stationary cycling is boring. So many people around the world, forget about FES bikes, have bought stationary bikes that become coat hangers. Um, because who wants to sit there and pedal and stare at a wall or stare at a number on the screen forever? That's why Peloton is so successful, because they took stationary cycling and they made it less boring. Um, that kind of thing has not translated to FES cycling, except in the context of mobile FES cycling, which is a lot more fun. But there's access, there's much greater access issues when we talk about mobile cycling. You can't buy a mobile FES bike in the United States, period. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but we need to make it increase social engagement around the activity, make it more motivating, make it more enjoyable. We're trying to figure out ways to do that. It's a really tough problem. Um, and then fortunately, one of the best things about FES cycling is the health and function part of this ramp is pretty well, if not maybe super well established in the data, it's at least well believed by the population. Most people who know about FES cycling believe that it has great health benefits and that it can help your function and, and all of those things. So that's the best thing that FES cycling has going for it. It's these other domains where it's seriously lacking, which is ultimately resulting in this situation where it's been around for 35 years and millions of people need it, but there's only a few thousand of them out there. Um, so we're trying to change that. I'm really interested if anybody has some good ideas on how to address these issues, I'm all ears. Um, but that's really all I have and all I really wanted to talk about. So thank you again for the opportunity, your time, your uh, participation, and for listening to me drone on. Um, open it up to questions. Two questions probably occur to everybody on that. Um, you make a big deal about cost and complexity. I think it's a valuable point. I think the company does a good job on that. How is that going to work for you in the future as a co-founder CTO when you start to grow your business and go transnational? Yeah. I mean, you've got, you haven't said what it is, but most of us know what your price point is. Oh, yeah, I didn't even say it. Our average, our average sale price on the minus cycle is 8500 So it's less than half the price. So of, if, yeah. if, for example, this country of France wants to adopt these things, how do you avoid the cost blowout of the various thing that you said, which is the need to have the support business around the bike, and you're right now only U.S. located and not even highly dispersed in the U.S. Right. How do you grow your business when uh, Vance and Amin want to buy six of these things, and, and they want to buy it at the same price point as sold in the United States, yeah. and they worry about, because they're working in a hospital or somewhere else, that it's got to have some kind of approval by their institution or by the EU marketing agency or whatever. How do you keep the cost contained when you get big? Mm -hmm. That was my first question. Yeah, and I think you know the answer to that question, which is distributors. 
So the beautiful thing about distributors, so for example, if we wanted to sell in France, I'm sure there's somebody in France who would do an excellent job of selling FES spikes for us. And we can even maintain the same price. And the beauty about that is, is they do all the work. So the, the hard part of doing this business is not designing and building bikes, it's selling and marketing bikes. And that's the beauty of having a distributor is they can do the sales and marketing for you. They know the local industry. I don't speak French, they do. They can help with that. And they are entitled to a large percentage of the profits of that sale. But you make the point, as you get these distributors, yeah. they're gonna start value adding the pricing. Mm -hmm. So to the end user, or to, to the vans, uh, yeah, to, to, to vans, even though you may give the distributor some wholesale price, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you to, to make Miles Cycle International Success, keep that rough price point of under $10,000 US, yeah. uh, which in Asia is a big problem anyway, yeah. but how do you do that? I do have a second question for technical. I'm curious what yeah. the solution is. So we can have a contract with the distributor that limits the amount, the price that they can advertise for. And then it's just a conversation and a negotiation about how much do we sell it to them for, how much are they allowed to mark it up for, and will they take it or not. Uh, but another thing about global expansion, because it opens up our market, we can sell more bikes. And as we sell more bikes, again, our cost of goods goes down. So it becomes more profitable per bike for us to make them, and we can then afford to have those kind of distributors and ideally bring the price farther down. The second and more technical question, um, and I don't want to, you have a private with it. You've clearly interpreted the 400 second Davis paper in a certain way and picked 35 hertz for an aerobic fitness benefit. I get all that. But largely ignoring the key element of the 400 second paper, which was when you move down speed of that to certain clinical population, you get other benefits to the MS user, to the CMP user, which come in at slower speeds and more muscle strength. What was your, I, I realize you made a business decision, I'm not querying you, but what was your decision making around cherry picking the top part of the story but ignoring the bottom part of the story? Mm -hmm. So the story with speed on the mile cycle, I mentioned this to you earlier, uh, the very first version of the mile cycle, you could vary the speed from 10 to I think 60 RPM. Um, but because of that, again, we're trying to reduce complexity as much as possible. We said, man, it'd be really nice if this was just one speed because having this variable speed really complicates things. Let's pick a speed and remove the variability aspect of it and test it with the market. And if anybody ever asks us to put variable speed back in, we'll do that. And we were shocked to find that nobody ever even brought up speed in the, what, four years of product testing with various iterations of the device throughout development. It maybe came up once, and when I gave an explanation, oh, okay, cool. Um, so it makes things a lot easier for us. We had to pick one speed to execute on that, and 35 was a good speed to pick, in part because of that uh, publication. Also because when we looked at the way people were using FES bikes clinically and in homes around the world, um, it was usually at 35 to 50 RPM, or 35 to 40 RPM, um, and then just in our own experience and testing, we like to be a little bit on the slow side as opposed to a little faster. You can understand that's true for the whole market. I completely accept the rationale. Yeah. But of course, you know, when you want to sell a dozen of these things at Swiss Paraplegic Center, which you might have done six months ago, that speed issue for the clinician who was knowledgeable in S. Bearish became a cold cut killer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's interesting. Time to reflect upon that decision? Yeah, well, it's interesting because we haven't had that same experience with people in the U.S. All of the, the major clinics that I go to in the U.S., they all set their bikes to one speed, and I would, don't ever really get any pushback on it. Um, but I mentioned we're making a new version of the product, and we might put variable speed in there, just for you. <laughs> for the clinicians of us. Yeah. Or, you know, there's variable speed, and then there's a different fixed point. Yeah, so, it would be a different fixed point. Yeah. 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 And are, is it a, a train of decisions where one thing depends on the next, depends on the next in terms of your fixed point? Like, I guess the question is, um, if I'm a customer that, that asked for a bike that went 15 RPMs, do, is there a downstream effect that, that picking a different speed would have? Or just picking a different set speed that you still get the, the streamlined effect of, your, of, of a lot of the, the advantages and simplicity that you have? If you allow for different speeds to be picked, it certainly increases the complexity. Um, 
whether it's one speed or another and how that affects other decisions, I mean, everything's intertwined. Yeah. Um, we just make the best decision that we can with based on the customer sure. feedback. Yeah, but I think you've read the papers quite well. You're right on marks here. That, that, that 35 and 15 are, are pretty much the two sweet spots. And I wouldn't offer anything more than that for a company of your site. Yeah, and we've thought about doing low speed, high speed. And yeah, we might do it that way. Do you make them, excuse me. <clears throat> do you make your own stimulators? Yes. And uh, what percentage of the cost is that to the overall bicycles? It's the second most expensive thing behind the motor. Motors are ridiculously expensive. And I guess, um, I, I think I read you, you did do an FDA, um, uh, what were they called? Um, 510K. 510K, yep. right, exactly. Um, who decided this has to be a medical device? I mean, why, why, why can't it just be a sports device for health? I mean, just because I like it, it's fun. That's a very... And there's no, and there's no because medical devices is... is, is, is it's, it's your claims. Mm -hmm. I claim there's been. I don't claim there's been. But I just claim it's fun. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. And that's a very fun question to talk about. Yeah. If you read the definition of medical device from the FDA, there's a very strong argument that an FES bike is not a medical device. Right. If you read the EU's definition of medical device, there is no question that an FES bike is a medical device. Okay. But none of that matters because a long time ago, for whatever reason, when the Urgis came out, the FDA said, this is, an, this is a medical device. We're gonna, you need to talk to us about it. And because that happened 35 years ago, we have to follow suit. Supposedly, there was a time where the FDA was this close to down-regulating it to a class one from a class two, which would be great, um, but they never did it. And so now, that the, uh, it's, it's a medical device, but it's a medical device, if I understand them right, because it's stimulation. Yeah. So if you took off the stimulation, you no longer have a medical device, you just have a, a bike. Correct. There. So... Well, uh, not quite. Right. It can still be classified as a medical device, depending on. So, for example, the Motomed, without oh. FES, is a medical device. Okay. It's but just a very low-risk device. Would the European community consider that? Should yes. Say, yeah, especially in the EU. Yeah, but they do have um, bikes that they sell, exercise bikes that they sell at the Decathlon here that aren't Correct. Uh, medical devices. Yeah, so, not all are. Yeah, okay. Then if we took, yeah, then, so I guess, um, so I guess the thing is, is having your stimulator as a medical device, I get that, but maybe not the bicycle part. Right, okay. Well, it's kind of weird because not all stimulators everywhere are medical devices. You can buy, you can go to the, after the 11 o'clock, News at night and buy something right. to stimulate your abs. Your abs or your the the turns about the same as a total ridiculous joke. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that, that gets me to tell stories. We're going to make a pause and continue the conversation. Yeah. Yeah.